Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Uh, would you please stand with me for a few minutes and let's just pray um, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Would you lift your hands and just close your eyes and let's pray in the Spirit and just ask the Holy Spirit to join us. We need a word from you, Lord, on this momentous occasion. Come on, open up your mouth. Just pray in the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to open up your heart to receive all that he has for you. And just thank him. What a great day to see his faithfulness and his goodness and his kindness to this house and to this place and to this family. To see where he has brought us from and all that he's brought us through. Lord, we are grateful and we thank you. We give you the praise, we give you the glory. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your kindness and your mercy. Truly, it's not of him that willeth, or of him that runneth, but it's you who gives mercy. And it's your mercy that brought our senior pastor and Sister Petrina and all the pastors and, and the family of CCC to this place 10 years ago. Thank you for all that you brought us through. We recognize your hand, Lord. This is not the work of a man. This is the hand of God. We celebrate your mercy as we think about the journey and the battles that you brought us through. We thank you for your presence that has been in this place and the lives that have been changed and transformed. We thank you for the word of God that has been preached from this very place. Thank you for the souls that have been saved and the bodies that have been healed and the destinies that have been transformed. Thank you for blessing each and every one of us in this blessed place. Today, as we celebrate 10 years of your goodness and your kindness, we welcome your presence in this place. For if your presence will not go with us, then don't take us anywhere, Lord. We want to be where you are. We want to hear your voice, Lord. Speak to every heart, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. Interrupt us, Lord. Interrupt our plans. Interrupt our schedules. And have your way in this place. Give an answer to every heart, Lord. Speak to every weary soul and strengthen us, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Well, what a pleasure and an honor it is for me to be here. Um, I'm here with my wife, um, who made the mistake of marrying me five years ago. And she's still paying for it. Um, and I came with some of our pastors from London as well. Just, we were actually just coming to celebrate with you. And uh, we were kindly asked by uh, Senior Pastor Petrina and Pastor Steve uh, and, and the team to speak. And for us, that's an honor. Amen. Being here brings back so many memories uh, because I was here for the dedication. Uh, I remember sitting on the side but behind Dr. Cho and uh, Pastor Prince, um, who are both not with us today. And I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, I could touch them. <laughs> and um, when I sat in this uh, auditorium, the first thought I had was not a spiritual thought. I just thought, oh wow, why can't we have chairs like this back home? <laughs> and uh, I remember all the great speakers uh, of that conference, I believe it was a Pentecostal World Fellowship Conference, and it was a mighty, mighty time that I still remember. I still remember some of those sermons. Uh, I was still in university um, in my final year. And it was such a, a time for me to be here. And the other times, I've been here many times uh, to, st to spend time with the Calvary family. And, you know, I spoke to my father this morning. And he just, you know, I could tell he was moved that it had been 10 years and we all just feel blessed to be part of the journey and the family that Calvary has been through. Amen. Um, so I bring you greetings from my parents, my mother, my father, and our, our church family. We've been blessed from here. Uh, Pastor Steve mentioned that my parents are, were very dear friends of uh, Pastor Prince and still, uh, still are of Sister Petrina, but they're, they're not actually friends. My dad hates it when we say he's a friend. He says he's a son of Calvary. And so I bring you greetings from your children, my parents. And um, he sends his love and his heart. And uh, I'm sure 
we will have some times of uh, reuniting very soon. Amen. Well, I feel like I spent most of my time already, but I want to share with you this morning on a, uh, what, I, what I titled, Can't You Do Just a Little Bit More? Amen. Oh, I didn't get an amen. As soon as I mentioned doing something, the church went quiet. Everybody say, can't you do just a little bit more? Now look at the most grumpy face in church today and look them in the eye and say, you can do a little bit more. Amen. Amen. I want to read from 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14. 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14. All right. And it says, now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. So Elisha was, the prophet Elijah was sick and about to die. And Joash, the king of Israel, came to see him and wept over his face and said, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Amen. Amen. Uh, in verse 15, Elisha said, he said to Joash, take a bow and arrows. And Joash took the bows and the arrows, and he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. So Elisha and uh, Joash, Elisha was weak, he's about to die. This is one of the greatest prophets in Israel. And he puts his hand on the bow with the king of Israel, and he says, open the window eastward. And he opened it, and then Elijah said, shoot. Everyone say, shoot. And he shot. I find this very funny. Shoot and he shot. But yeah, I, I think the translator could have done better. <laughs> okay. Shoot and he shot. I mean, what else is he going to do? He's going to shoot. He said shoot. Okay. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. Now, Israel was at war with Syria while this was going on. So this was the prophet prophesying the word of the Lord. Amen. And he said, um, the arrow of deliverance from Syria, you will smite the Syrians in Aphek uh, until you have consumed them. Then he said, take the arrows. Now, notice that the first, the first instruction was about shooting the bow. And the second instruction was, had to do with just the arrows. So he said, take the arrows. And Joash took them and he said to the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. That's King James English for, he took the arrows and hit the ground three times and he stopped. Okay? The prophet said, take the arrow, I'm about to die and I, I want to prophesy to you about how God is going to deliver Israel from Syria. So he says, take the arrows and use them to hit the ground. Go ahead. And then the king takes the arrows and hits the ground three times and stops. And the man of God was wroth with him. Okay? Pastors get angry. So the pastor was angry. Jesus said, be angry and sin not. If you take away the sin not part, it just says be angry. Okay. So the man of God got upset and said, uh, you should have smitten five or six times. Then you would have smitten Syria until you had consumed it. Whereas now you will smite Syria but three times. And the next verse says, and Elisha died. I like that. He didn't even give that guy a chance to respond. He just died. <laughs> and, and they buried him. Amen. <laughs> uh, and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming of the year. Now, this is, this is a special message, I believe, for us as we do 10 years. I mean, one of the, the best things a pastor can do for church members is to make them travel. And I can tell you, I've been all over the world to so many different churches. And what you have here is something spectacular. You, you've given, you know, the last time I was here was before COVID, for my honeymoon, by the way. I had my honeymoon in um, Malaysia, truly Asia. But, <laughs> and, okay. Well, I should say that more often. I got some life from you. Uh, but my, my, uh, my memory of coming here was you putting up uh, screen slides. You know, this was in 2018, so that must have been five years ago, I believe. And you were celebrating five years 
of being here. So I've been here for five and I've been here for ten and I was here for the dedication. I'm not bad. <laughs> and I remember Pastor Prince putting up these slides, showing how much everyone had given, you know, showing some properties um, that you had sold to pay for this property. And I remember him saying he was not going to give up the old church in Damansara. And I remember just the faith. I remember him standing here and saying, you know, so many people had given and he was thanking the church for their faithfulness and, and for, and it's not been easy if you've been here long enough, you know, if you just came, you think this is how it's always been. No, there's been a lot of battles for us to be here, but the message from God is, can't you do a little bit more? You've, you struck the ground three times and it brought us here. But if you can just strike the ground two or three more times, God will give us the final victory that he's asked us for. And God is asking CCC, are you tired? Can you do a little more for God? Can you press a little further? Oh, I'm getting some response here. Can you do more for Jesus? Yes. And that's the, that's the question God is asking from every single person in this place. Amen. So the man of God said, strike the ground. You know, God always gives instructions without telling us how much we should do. What did he say? Go into the world and preach the gospel. How much gospel? How many people? He said, preach to every creature. How many creatures? He said to build his church. How many churches? He said to seek first the kingdom. For how long? How many? Now, we always stop short of doing what God wants us to do because usually we get tired. What does the Bible say in Galatians chapter 6 verse 9? Let us not be weary in well-doing. Okay? Now this is interesting. Can you put it up on the screen? It's interesting because the King James says well-doing. If you switch that around, it makes much more sense. Doing well. Okay? It says let us not be weary in doing well. So when we're doing well, our greatest enemy is tiredness. But the Bible says if we don't get tired, we will reap if we faint not, if we can keep going, we will do better. Can I have an amen? amen? And so today I'm here to challenge every member of the Calvary family, and I'm part of the Calvary family, and I'm, I'm here to challenge all of us. We can give some more. We can preach some more. We can start another church. We can start another campus. We can raise more pastors. We can have more conferences. We can touch more people. We can do more missions. We can do something greater and better. We can strike the ground one more time. Amen. Now, um, I want to give you some reasons why you can do a little bit more in the few minutes we have. Number one, it says, because the work stands undone. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen? The work stands undone. John chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Everyone say, lift up your eyes. And look on the fields, for they are white all ready to harvest. Lift up your eyes. Now, what does that mean? When your eyes are down, you just see yourself. You can only see what's going on here. When, you, when your eyes are down, you can only see what concerns you. And when I look at this beautiful church, I can see something wonderful. There's not much else to be done. The lights are working. The air conditioning is working. The screens look amazing. The music was fantastic. I felt like singing that song again. I felt like Pastor Steve came up too early. And, you know, we're okay. We have comfortable seats. I can see three or four people even falling asleep. Don't worry, the Lord gives his beloved rest. But there's nothing else to do. But CCC, if we lift up our eyes and look, we look outside of this building and we look outside of what God is doing here, we'll see that the harvest in KL and the harvest in Malaysia and the harvest in Southeast Asia and the harvest around the world, it's white and it's ready for you to reach out. We were, we were fine in Damansara. You know, I, I, I watched my father preaching. Sometimes when I pray, I like to watch um, videos of preaching. And I, I recently I was watching my father preaching in Damansara. What a wonderful church and what a wonderful time we had there. But Sina, Pastor Prince, he looked away from himself and he looked at the harvest and he said, there's room for more. 
And today, look at the people gathered here today to give God glory. Today, we worship God in this place because somebody lifted up his eyes to look away from where, where we were comfortable and where everything was okay to do some more. And then I challenge you. You know, when the Holy Spirit is absent from a place, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the place is dead. You think about Adam, beautiful body with eyes and a heart and lungs and a, a nose. I mean, you, you can imagine the beauty of mankind. And he was lying there, but he was dead. Beautiful, nicely arranged, but dead. And that's how the church is without the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, the Lord breathed. Job said, your spirit gave me life. When the Holy Spirit entered into the dead body of Adam, Adam came to life. And the church of Jesus Christ can be beautiful with air conditioning and screens. I love air conditioning. I have an air conditioned church. I believe that the presence of God goes with a cool atmosphere. <laughs> you remember in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says the Lord came down in the cool of the day. God doesn't like hot churches. I tell pastors all the time. So I love air conditioning and I love the screens. And I, I, I love coming to church. You know, I love coming to church. It's, it's a great feeling. Driving into church and just walking into the auditorium to hear from God. It's wonderful. But without the presence of the Holy Spirit, the church dies. It's beautiful but dead. There's something empty about it. You know, recently in our church, I, I saw someone came up to lead worship and the person sang a song. And then we, we, the service went on and then the, the, the worship team came back on and someone else sang the same song. And it was completely different. The presence of the Holy Spirit was there. Because when the presence of God is there, it's different. It's alive. And what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? When the Holy Spirit comes, he, he helps us to see our true state. You remember in Revelation chapter 3, when the Holy Spirit spoke to the church, he said, you're lukewarm. What's a lukewarm Christian? A lukewarm Christian is someone who is not an unbeliever. I believe in God. I'm just not on fire for him. The Holy Spirit hasn't set my heart ablaze with something to do for him. And a lukewarm Christian says, I am rich and I have need of nothing. And everything is fine. And everything is okay. But he says, I counsel you to anoint your eyes so that you see your true state. He says, you don't know that you are wretched and you are naked. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what do we look like to the Lord? What does, what does CCC look like to God? What does God want from us? And that's why I keep using the example of, of Pastor Prince. He said, it's not enough that we have a nice church in Damansara. It's not enough that everyone comes to church. You know, everyone likes a nice, cozy church where we have tea and we have cake after church and we, we hug everyone and everyone knows everyone. But if you know the work that God has called us to and the lost souls that are dying, you'll know there's more to do and we can do a little bit more because the work is unfinished. Amen. Can I get an amen from CCC? Amen. Yeah. You know, my dad is probably watching on live stream, so if you don't say amen, he'll say I didn't preach good. So <laughs> just for my sake, you know, keep giving me an amen. <laughs> All right. Now, number two. Because no one can do what you can do. No one can do what you can do. You know, I tell you, the kingdom of God needs every hand involved. You know, there are some people who gave for this building to be finished. There are some people who came here. I'm sure there are some architects and some, some people who are professionals who came and contributed to this church. You know, the pastors, they gave, they, they gave their hearts to the visions. It takes more than one person to do the work of God. And there are some things that only you can do. Amen. Now in John, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. This is, the, this is Luke. Now, most people think that Luke was a disciple. This is what happens when you don't go for Sunday school. Luke was not a disciple. Luke was someone who became a believer and followed Jesus. But he was not one of the 12 apostles that Jesus trained. Now, but he says, for as much as many have taken in hand, Luke was saying a lot of people have taken it in hand to write the story of Jesus. Then he said, but it seemed good. Look at verse 3. He says, it seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all the things from the very first, to also write in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things where you have been instructed. Amen. What was Luke saying? I know Matthew wrote. I know Mark wrote. I know John wrote. But I also feel like I should write. 
Now you would think, come on, how many stories of Jesus can we have? We get it. The guy came, he lived, miracles, he died. God bless you. But without Luke, there would be no story of, good Samaritan, of the Good Samaritan. Without Luke, there would be no story of the lost coin. Without Luke, the story of the prodigal son would be lost. Now, without Luke, there will be no parable of the lost sheep. Can I, wait, no Sunday school? The lost sheep, prodigal son. Come on, CCC. The wedding guest, the rich fool. Now, then John comes along. John was 16 years old when the Lord was on earth. Now, John could have said, I don't need to write. Matthew wrote, Mark wrote, Luke wrote. I'm done. But without John, we wouldn't have known that we have to be born again. It's John who said, except a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. Without John, we wouldn't have, had the, wouldn't have known that Jesus was the bread of life. You know the story of the woman at the well. It's only John who wrote that story. We wouldn't have known about Lazarus. Can you imagine? We wouldn't have known that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We wouldn't have known about the pool of Bethesda and the, and the man who Jesus healed by the pool. Because everyone's hand needs to be involved. I thank God for what Matthew did. I thank God for what Mark did. But I tell you, Luke has to write and John has to write. And I tell you, CCC, I give God glory for what Pastor Prince has done in this church. I give God glory for what uh, Sister Petrina has done. I give God glory for what Pastor Steve has done. But every single one of us in church today has something important to do. And the question the Holy Spirit is asking is, can't you do just a little bit more? Can I have an amen? I told you my dad is watching. I need your help. <laughs> Tell him I'm doing good. Amen. Number three, and I'm almost done. Because someone is counting on you. Everyone say, someone is counting on me. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. No, Peter and John went to the temple in Jerusalem. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily. They laid how often? Everyone say daily. At the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he was begging them for alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them. He looked at them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Amen. Now, what's the significance of this story? This man had been lame for many years from his mother's womb, and he was a man, which means he had been sitting at that temple every day for years. This miracle happened a few weeks after Jesus Christ went to be with the Lord. So it means when Jesus went to the temple, this man was there. This man was lame right there at the temple, but Jesus did not heal him for whatever reason. But you may think that Jesus Christ solved every problem in Jerusalem, but this lame man was counting on Peter and John doing a little bit more. He was counting on them doing their part and also going out to preach and to heal the sick. Without them, this man would have stayed lame. And so the work is not only for Jesus. In fact, Jesus declared to us on the cross, it is finished. But it was still time for Peter and John. And now it's time for you. And there's somebody out there who is counting on you. He's counting on you to give an offering. He's counting on you to bring people to church. He's counting on you to win a lost soul. He's counting on you to pray for somebody and to step out and help somebody. Can't you do just a little bit more? Somebody out there is counting on you. You know, I, I, I grew up in church. I, I tell people I joined the church when I was born because I didn't have a choice. From, from when I was a child, I had to go to church every Sunday. And, you know, it may have looked, and my father was a pastor, but I gave my life to Christ when I was a teenager because there was a youth pastor in the church who set his heart on me and he set his mind on me. And God bless him for eternity because without him, I wouldn't have found Jesus Christ. And he prayed for me and he visited me and he looked after And he never assumed that you are the pastor's son. You are the senior pastor's son. You are okay. He looked out for me and he preached to me and he led me to Jesus Christ. And I'm standing here today because of what he did. I tell you, somebody will only respond to your sermon. 
I never, my, I never responded to the sermons my father preached or the sermons my mother preached. I responded to the sermons that that pastor preached. He was the one that God had ordained to bring me to Jesus Christ. I tell you, I can preach forever. Uh, uh, all your pastors can preach forever. But until every CCC member takes up their cross to follow Jesus, until everyone does their part, there's somebody out there who will only respond to you. You know, this is such a large church with so many people here this morning but we could have been four. And why are we not four? Because some people didn't do their part. If everybody was to preach the gospel and do their part, there'll be, there'll be more people, more souls saved. There'll be more, more of God's power and God's move here when everyone gets involved. Can I have an amen? amen. Now, number four. Wow, my time's up. God is counting on you. Now, apart from the fact that someone uh, is counting on you, God himself is counting on you. Now, one of my favorite passages in scripture is Hebrews chapter 11. You know, when it talks about the heroes of faith, uh, when it talks about Moses, you know, who parted the Red Sea, and it talks about Gideon, who won a great victory for Israel, and it talks about Noah, who walked with God. I mean, Noah was fantastic. He built a boat on dry land. You know, that, that takes a lot of faith, and he built it, it took him 100 years. So for a hundred years, he was nailing, and everyone was asking him, what's going on? And he said, God told me something. And everyone would just say, he's, he's mad. And he had so much faith, he built a boat. Then the Bible talks about Enoch, who walked with God. It talks about Abel, who gave a, a, a more excellent sacrifice. Abel gave a great offering. You know, that's a great testimony. When we get to heaven and it's testimony time, Moses will say, I parted the Red Sea. Noah will say, I built a boat. Uh, Gideon will say, I fought a big battle. And... Uh, Abel will say, well, I gave an offering. Wow. Your offering will be remembered in heaven. Amen. 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 Now, it talks about all of these heroes. It talks about the apostles. You know, when I went to the Vatican, I saw the apostles have been made to be these big, huge statues. Those guys weren't, they were ordinary people like you and me. But when Hebrews 11 finishes listing all of these great people that God has used, then it goes to Hebrews 12 verse 1. And Paul says, seeing that we are compassed with this great crowd of witnesses, all the people in Hebrews 11 are standing in the stands, the stadium of heaven, and they are watching us, including senior Pastor Prince. He's standing there. He's happy. If, if you ask him to come back for the 10th anniversary, you say, no, they'll be all right. They'll be fine. Because, because he's happy in heaven watching us and he's in the stadium and he's urging us on to keep on going he's asking the same question the holy spirit is asking can you guys do a little bit more i know you did some great work but can you do a little bit more and the bible says because of this cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before you you know all those guys in hebrews 11 they were ordinary people moses you call Moses a great guy. Moses was a murderer who ran away for 40 years. You talk about Abraham. Abraham lied about his wife. He, he told Pharaoh, that's not my wife, because he was afraid. You call him the father of faith. Noah, he built a boat. Yes, but he had a problem with alcohol. These were ordinary people. The church suddenly went quiet when I said alcohol. Is there a problem? Everybody okay? Can I have an Amen. <laughs> But these are ordinary people, all the apostles full of fear, jealousy, always fighting amongst each other, but God had still called them. I don't know what weaknesses and what problems you have in your life. I don't know what inefficiencies you have in your life, but God has called you. God wants to use you. God has a plan for you. And Noah is urging you on. Abraham is praying for you. Enoch is saying you can do it. You know, I tell my pastors, if you need someone to give an offering, Abel is in heaven. He can't do it, but I'm here, Lord. If you need someone to believe, Abraham isn't available, but I'm here. And if God needs someone to walk with him, Enoch isn't here, but I'll walk with you, Lord. I'm, I'm telling you, God is counting on each and every one of us to do our part and to run the race that has been set in front of us. Can I have an amen? amen. And finally, because we must fulfill our ministries and our life's purpose. Amen. Now, God has called all of us to do something for him. God is asking every single one of us to finish what he has called us to do. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, I don't know if you ever bought a meal 
at McDonald's or KFC. Uh, when you when you want to buy a, 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 I don't know what meal packages you have here. We in KFC we have a Streetwise, which is two pieces of chicken, pack of fries, and a drink. Now when you buy the chicken, you can't say I don't want the drink. It comes together. They give you the whole bag. You can't say I'll have the chicken, but I won't have the I won't have the fries. And in this scripture, it's telling us when you receive mercy, you receive the ministry. It says, we have this ministry as we have received mercy. God's mercy on your life came with a ministry. Paul said, we are saved and called with a holy calling. We're not just saved to just be here. Or else I would die. I would just jump off the top of a building. Why would I be here? Heaven where the streets are made of gold. Heaven, there's no electricity bills and no water bills. In heaven, there's no tax. There's no VAT. In heaven, there's no COVID, no lockdowns. The Bible says there's no more pain, no more tears, no more heartbreaks. You can't, you can't, your boyfriend can't leave you in heaven because there's no more tears. There's no hunger. So why are we here? We're here because there's a job for us to do. There's something for us to do. And Christians, and you know, I tell you, I tell you, we, we've become probably the most carnal generation of Christians. You know, what does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. It says, take no thought. What, will, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? How shall we be clothed? For these things do the Gentiles seek after. But your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things that Gentiles are seeking for will be added unto you. God wants to bless you. God wants you to drive the car you want. He wants you to live where, where you want to live. He wants your family to be blessed and provided for. But he says, don't think about that. Don't set your heart on that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. I tell you, the church must become more focused on the kingdom, on what God wants, and less focused on what we need and what we want. Paul said, I go bound to Jerusalem, knowing not what things shall befall me, except that there's beatings and persecutions and prison waiting for me. And then he says, but none of these things move me, that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, my friends, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, once in, in secondary school, I ran out of school. It was a boarding school and wasn't supposed to go out. I ran out of school and went to buy food with my friends. And all of us got caught coming back. We couldn't defend ourselves because we were carrying the food. <laughs> so there was no escape. And we sat, I, I tell you this story as I close, I have two more minutes. Uh, and we sat in this, um, we sat in this uh, waiting room of the headmaster. And the headmaster would shout our names and call us in. So I heard, Frederick! And then he would get up and he would go in. And we don't know what would happen there. And then he would come out and he would be shaking his head, guys, it's not easy in there. Then I heard, Joshua! I almost peed my pants. I had to stand up, walk into the room to receive my judgment. Friends, all of us are going to one day be in that waiting room. And we're going to hear our names called one by one. And God is going to judge us. And he said, oh... I didn't do too bad. I'm good. Jesus Christ has died for my sins. See, when we get into the judgment seat of Christ, it has nothing to do with our sin because the Bible says Jesus has washed our sins away. That's not what we're being judged for. We are, when I go into heaven, I won't, I won't go into heaven because I've preached many sermons or because I'm a pastor. I go into heaven because Jesus' blood washed away my sins. But after that, the Bible says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So my judgment is going to be, Joshua, I had 140 things for you to do on earth, but you were so concerned with your family, your job, your life, your car. You wanted to get a Tesla, even though it didn't make sense. You wanted to get, you wanted to make your life better. You wanted to switch from Samsung to, iPhone, to an iPhone. You wanted to move from an apartment into a condo. And that's all you live for. You, your business, you, yourself, I, me, I, only you. And God will say, you never did what I wanted you to do. You never sought first my kingdom. You, you put me to the side. You made me number two. And that's where we're going to be judged. And everyone sitting here is going to have that judgment. And so today I ask you one more time from the Holy Spirit. On his behalf, I ask you, can't you do just a little bit more for Jesus before your time is up? And I speak to the older generation who's almost, you know, the older generation, 
have done so well, but I beg you as your child, can you do a little bit more for us? Can you raise a few more sons and a few more daughters? Can you mentor a few more people? Can you help? Just before the end, you know, just before Jesus said it is finished, he won one more soul. He turned to the right and he turned to the thief. He said, I'm in pain, I'm in agony, but I got a few more minutes left on this earth and I can win one more soul and I can do one more thing and I can push one last time. And when he said it is finished, his work and his ministry was finished. And I pray that when you say it is finished your work and your job here on earth will be done in Jesus name and everyone said Amen. please stand to your feet with me please stand to your feet with me and uh, I just pray the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and he'll put a vision and give you something in your heart you want to do for him and for this house there's still so much to be done the church still needs so much help the church still has a big vision to accomplish for Jesus Christ and I pray that his presence and his grace will touch your heart to do more for him. Just bow your heads and just pray for yourself for two minutes. Say, Lord, use me. Touch my life. Do what you will with me, Lord. Give me, give me something to do for you. Show me what my ministry is. Show me what my mission and my purpose is. I want to finish it before my time is up. I want to give my heart to you, Lord. I want to live for you. And now, if you're here today, uh, please bow your heads. Please close your eyes. And you don't know Jesus as your Lord, your personal Savior. Amos says a terrible thing. He says, prepare to meet your God. We go to school to prepare for a great career. We bath in the morning to get ready for a productive day. But I tell you, here on earth, we have to live our lives preparing to stand before Jesus and preparing to meet him. A lot of people say, oh, I, I went to church a few times. Going to church doesn't make you know Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible says the Lord knows them that are his and he knows those who don't belong to him. And if you're here today, you want to give your heart over to Jesus Christ. You want to say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to give my heart to you. I want, I want to give my heart to Jesus, sorry. I want to live for him. I want him to come and turn my life around. If you're here like that, just everyone bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to just lift up your right hand, just right where you're standing. And I want to lead you to pray to give your heart to Jesus. Just, you don't have to move. Just lift up your right hand wherever you are, all over this place. Just lift it high above your head. Say, I choose Jesus. I want him to come into my heart and change my life. I see all the hands lifted. I want you to just repeat right after me. And the whole church, let's pray together. Keep your hands up as we pray. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I come to you today, come to you today just, as I am. just as I am. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. Wash me in your blood. Write my name in the book of life. So that one day I come to heaven to be with you. Now say, Jesus, I know you can see me. I know you know my name. I know you know who I am. And today I surrender my life to you. Today I give my days to you. Now say, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died for my sins and I believe you rose again on the third day. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.